Okay, moving on, Thirst Nation. Um, who likes skiing? Okay, so you're going to learn about um, why actually thirst, in, when, here at Thirst, you're going to learn why skiing is going to suck with climate change, actually. So uh, our next speaker um, was a former sailor, or I should say was a sailor in a former life, and she has the tattoos to prove it. She's going to come on stage and show you those tattoos. So without further ado, I want to bring up uh, Liz Burakowski. All right, well, thank you, everyone. I'm so excited to be a part of Thirst DC. This is going to be fantastic. I'm going to tell you about climate change in the ski industry, and I'd like to clarify that I'm actually not a skier. I'm a splitboarder now. I've been snowboarding for 20 years, and I just recently switched to splitboarding, and it's amazing. Okay, splitboarding is when you take a snowboard, you split it in half, and then you go up the mountain, and then you put it back together, and then you snowboard down, and it's really fun. All right, Cl how climate change is melting the ski industry. This is one of my favorite mountains in Maine. This is Sunday River. This was taken on Christmas Day in 2006. You'll note that they're missing a key ingredient here, and that would be the snow. Resorts like this are probably not going to survive much into the future, especially by the end of the century. So think 100 years from now, my grandchildren will not be snowboarding at this resort, unfortunately. So albedo, if we want to talk about skiing, we need to talk about albedo. How many people know what albedo means? A little bit. Okay, for those in the audience who have not heard of albedo and don't know what it means, I'd like to make something crystal clear. Albedo is not libido. You have no idea how many times I have been asked this in casual conversation. They're like, oh, what do you study? And I'm like, albedo, and they're like, do tell more. <laughs> not the same thing. I love him, he's so great. All right, albedo, your new favorite Scrabble word. It's worth nine points on the board. Put it on a triple word, and you will get 27 points. It's great. Albedo is a measure that you can actually teach to fifth graders. So I'm going to ask you a simple question. What color t-shirt do you wear on a hot summer day? Would you wear white? Or would you wear black? Survey says? White, exactly. If you chose white, that's because you like to stay cool. Doesn't he look so cool? He does look cool. And the reason he is so cool is because he is reflecting the sun's energy. When you have white surfaces, they reflect the sun's energy. When you have black surfaces, you absorb the sun's energy and you get hot. David Beckham, example A. All right. So now that we know albedo, I need to tell you about my first albedo experiment. This is my twin sister. She's now a parks planner in the Parks and Rec Department over in Manchester, New Hampshire. Beautiful city. Love the bike path, Jess. And this is me. You can tell it's me because I got the gigantic dimples. And I have to say, Tom, I look way cuter in a one-piece snowsuit than you do, especially when I have my twin sister next to me. And while we're on the topic of twins, I just want to say, Michael, Gavin, do you guys always dress alike? Because seriously, you look more like twins than Jess and I do. That's my twin sister right there. All right, so going back to my first albedo experiment, we are driving from Wisconsin to New Jersey to go to the Jersey Shore. I don't know why this theme keeps popping up in this. So the Jersey Shore, we're on the umpteenth toll on the, er on the turnpike. Yeah, I'm getting a little flashy here, huh? Um, and I'd been sitting in the front seat with my mom. This is back when kids could sit in the front seat of cars. We didn't have DVD players, and you had to actually use real money to pay the toll. There was no easy pass or fast lane. So I got, I would, got to noticing that the pennies were a lot hotter than the dimes. And this just really intrigued my six-year-old self. So what did I do? I took a penny, I took a dime, and I put them on the dashboard. You'll know just by looking at them, you can tell they have different albedo. We get to the umpteenth toll on the Garden State Parkway, and my mom reaches for my dime. And I, said, I reach out, I grabbed her wrist, and I was like, Mom, do not touch that. Why not? I'm doing an experiment. I was a very precocious six-year-old child, and it was my first albedo experiment. It's really funny, because today I'm still at University of New Hampshire studying what? Oh, albedo. It's a really long study, tell me. Well, so I've made it my goal in life to teach everyone on Earth the meaning of the word albedo. Check, check, check. All of you are checked off of my list. All right. If we're going to talk about albedo, we also need to understand its effect on temperature. This is a map of temperature on the globe since 1884. 
When you look at the globe, all the areas in blue are cooler than the long-term average. Areas in red are warmer than the long-term average. You'll note in the 1930s, the US lights up in red. That's the Dust Bowl. As we get into the 1960s, you're gonna see the globe start to cool down a bit. And scientists believe that this is because of all the pollution that got into the atmosphere from the burning of coal. The 1970s come along, we have the Clean Air Act, all that soot gets cleaned out of the atmosphere, and now you'll start seeing things warm up again. So at this point, I'll shut up, and I'll let the movie deliver its punchline, because it's pretty dramatic. Right, so where's all the warming happening? Up in the Arctic. Oh, it just started again. Yep. So all of the warming is happening in the Arctic. And the reason this is happening is related to albedo. So if we can get to the next slide. There we go. All right, this is a map of sea ice. Note how the sea ice cap looks like a gigantic white t-shirt over the Arctic Ocean. As the sea ice starts to retreat, it's rever revealing a much darker surface. This is the ocean that is going to be absorbing more of the sun's energy and exacerbating the temperature change up in the Arctic. This is why we see the Arctic light up in red in that previous video. 2007 had been the previous record for low sea ice extent, but you might have remembered seeing in the news last year that 2012 shattered that record right there. So note, a lot more black t-shirt showing up than white t-shirt. But this effect is not limited to the Arctic. We also have snow on the ground. So take a look at this event. What we had here was a snowstorm come through. That's what that big band is over on the left. It went over the Great Lakes, and you ended up with some beautiful lake effect snow. These areas that are covered in snow are up to eight degrees cooler than the adjacent areas that don't have snow. And it's because of albedo. It's a very localized effect, and when we're losing snow, we are further increasing surface temperature. So since 1970, we've seen in summer warming on the order of about, oh, it's like one degree warmer than it was in 1970. When you look at winter, it's triple that. Winter in the Northeast US is three degrees warmer than it was in 1970. And this puts a lot of places like New Jersey at, oh, little help. <laughs> I have a software update, sorry guys, one moment. You might be able to just... <laughs> no problem. <laughs> sorry. I think we're good, Eric. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so speaking of New Jersey, this is actually my mom. And she's not ice fishing in Canada, she's not ice fishing in Wisconsin or in New Hampshire. This is taken in New Jersey. This was in Lake Hopakong, and it was her first pickerel and her last. And it's important to note here that New Jersey ice fishing tournaments have been canceled because of no ice or thin ice. And it's becoming a problem. It's not just the sea, uh, sea ice fishing industry though, this is ski resorts too. And this comes to the bulk of my talk right now. We had hundreds of these tiny little ski resorts dotting the Northeast US. Today, 600 of them have been closed because they cannot keep up with the snow. If you don't have snow making, you cannot stay open in the Northeast US. And now, you've heard about the jet stream. The jet stream, like I had said, meant, uh, or like Tom had said, affects climate in that you get these locking patterns. So we're gonna take a different approach to teaching you about the jet stream. And I'm gonna need my volunteer, Shannon. Everyone welcome Shannon to the stage. Shannon is my friend from DC. <laughs> Lovely Shannon. Shannon is going to be an interpretive dance of the jet stream. <laughs> She's gonna do wonderfully. So what we need to do, remember those wiggles from Tom's talk? So let's see the little wiggles going on. Beautiful, Shannon, lovely. All right, now she's gonna get locked in a position, like, like that. Imagine if you're in New Hampshire down here, or sorry, right up here. You're gonna be in the cold end of that jet stream, right? All the air above her arm is cold, all the air below is going to be hot. So if you're above that, oh, come on, here we go. You're gonna end up with a feast for snow because you're in that cold area. Once the jet stream gets, oh, sorry. 
you're gonna end up with feast, and it leads to events like this. Remember Snowpocalypse? Snowpocalypse was when you got locked in this position, okay? Continue your lovely dance. If you get locked in the other position, and you're stuck below the jet stream, you're gonna end up with a lot of heat, and you're going to lose your snow. I'm sure you guys all remember last year, in March 2012, it was 80 degrees in New Hampshire. I know, I was trying to measure snow, and it all melted. I ended my season in mid-March. It was a pretty sad scientific study season. Shannon, thank you so much for your lovely dancing. That was amazing. <laughs> Shannon. When you look at the long-range forecast, it's not just about feast and famine. We're also looking at snow loss in the Northeast US. This is typically the region that sees at least 30 days of snow cover over the course of a winter. Fast forward 100 years, and this is the area that we can expect to see have snow cover. If you're a skier and you like to go to Pennsylvania, and actually, little known fact, Pennsylvania has more skiers than Vermont and New Hampshire. That's pretty amazing. They're not gonna have enough snow to stay open, unfortunately, so you're gonna have to come to New Hampshire and spend your money there. It's not just the ski resorts and a frou-frou sport that you need to worry about, though. We have a lot of people in New Hampshire that are employed by the ski industry, including the lift operators, the ski instructors, the people at the bar doing their apres ski thing. I love this guy's mustache, by the way. I totally wish I could grow facial hair. It looks amazing. The people who spend money on gas to get up there. And the hotels as well. There's a ton of money in this. It adds up to about $12.2 billion when you look at the services provided by the ski industry. And this equates to 211,000 jobs. Are you like... Yeah. <laughs> but it is not just a frou-frou sport. I don't dress like this when I go snowboarding, but it's, it's somewhat close. We also have to worry about snow loss and its effect on moose populations. There's big tip em tick epidemics that we have in New Hampshire. New Hampshire currently has the second worst rate of Lyme disease in the US, followed closely by Connecticut. And a lot of this is being driven by snow loss because the ticks will overwinter when they don't have snow to kill them off. We also had forest fires. Recall in Colorado out west? It was on fire, and a lot of that was due to having low snow cover to keep them at bay. So my question to you is, what will you lose? For me, it's snow, and it's skiing, and it's snowboarding. I want to ask you what your things are. So come find me afterward, and I'd love to chat with you about it. Thank you so much.